So now we're going to move on to the Calvin cycle, which is responsible for carbon fixation. Now, so to help you keep the Calvin cycle straight with another cycle called the Krebs cycle you'll be hearing later, I want to throw up this quick little picture. Photosynthesis happens in trees, right? Well, who likes to sit under a tree but a little boy named Calvin? And if you remember on uh, the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes, that's sort of what I'm going for here, is this is that supposed to be Calvin? Calvin likes to hang out and talk to his best friend, who is his stuffed tiger that comes to life, and his name is Hobbes. And let me just throw Hobbes in here real quick. Um, now, these are not my best drawing skills, but Hobbes has his foot propped up in his very relaxed under the tree, and he and Calvin like to chit-chat under the tree where photosynthesis is occurring. And they do this in the sunshine. So let's just stick a nice bright sunshine up here. Photosynthesis occurs um, in trees and plants, and if you can remember that sunlight is where Calvin likes to sit around, then the light cycle, or the light reaction, and the Calvin cycle are both in photosynthesis. So now, to get on to the Calvin cycle itself, the Calvin cycle is the process of carbon fixation. And that carbon that we have to fix in photosynthesis during the Calvin cycle comes from the atmosphere, and it enters the leaves where photosynthesis occurs. It enters the leaves through pores called stomata. And now this leaf I've drawn, what you're seeing in green there, are actually called guard cells. They are kidney bean shaped cells found on either side of the stomata that regulate whether it is open or shut to allow gas exchange. So as I mentioned, that black dot there in the middle is your stomata, or your stomate, and then on either side of that you will have the guard cells. Now, the guard cells are extremely important, but we'll get to those in just a minute. Through the stomata you have gas exchange, and a gas that needs to enter is carbon dioxide, so the Calvin cycle or carbon fixation can occur. Coming out of the stomata you have oxygen, which is the waste material from the light cycle of photosynthesis. These are the desired exchanges, but there's a trick. When the pore is open, water vapor may also get out, and this is called transpiration. Perspiration is human sweating, transpiration is like plants sweating water vapor, and plants can use a very lose water in this way. So to prevent this, plants have guard cells on either side of their stomata, and these guard cells regulate the opening and closing or the accessibility of that stomata to the air. And I've colored the stomata itself in red there. So what we're looking at are two cells with very large central vacuoles. Now yes, most plant cells do have a very large central vacuole, but in the guard cells, it is absolutely critical to the function of these cells because the amount of water in that central vacuole determines whether or not the stomata is accessible or not. When the central vacuole, and let me go ahead and just label that very quickly here, we have a central vacuole in both of these sets of cells. Just going to make sure that's nice and clear. So there's the central vacuoles. If you will look at the guard cells on the left, you'll notice their central vacuoles are much larger and fuller looking than those on the right. That is because these central vacuoles are full of water and they have a great deal of turgor pressure or water pressure inside of them. When the cell's central vacuoles are full, there's a great deal of pressure on the cell, so the cell becomes very rigid and swollen and full. And when these cells are full, they resemble the kidney bean shape and they sort of turn out away from the stomate. This allows it to be open and accessible for gas exchange. So here you can have carbon dioxide going in, oxygen coming out, and you will also lose water as well this way. Now take a look here at the cells on the right. These, it is not possible to see the stomata between these cells because they are very low in water and when this occurs, the central vacuoles sort of shrivel up, the whole cell becomes flaccid or floppy and loose, and just sort of flops over the opening, blocking it from gas exchange. So when these cells are completely relaxed, the stomata is not, is not visible or accessible. When they, are, when they are full of water and fully engorged, they fill up, they sort of turn out, and it allows gas exchange to happen. So this is very 
very important because for cells to be able to regulate water loss, especially in certain environments, is absolutely critical. Many factors actually affect how much water is in these central vacuoles, but the one I want you to really focus on is the amount of water the plants have available to themselves. So if there's plenty of water available, they can keep these central vacuoles full. When water levels drop and the plant begins to wilt, the central vacuoles will shut down, preventing additional water loss, which also slows down photosynthesis. So there's a swap here because you're not getting that gas exchange. So let's scoot on back over here and take a look at what's happening with carbon fixation. Now we're actually going to have three molecules of carbon dioxide and they're going to bind with RUBP via an enzyme called Rubisco and you definitely want to remember Rubisco. It is the most common enzyme in the world because every plant that goes through photosynthesis has it. Now this forms a six carbon intermediate that is unstable that immediately breaks down into six molecules of 3PG. 3PG is then reduced by ATP to produce six BPGs. This is then going to be, re going to be reduced and it will then form G3P, which is also called PGAL. And I'm not going to get into all the different terminology. There are too many different names for some of these formulas for you to worry about at this time. The G3P, only one of those is going to be pulled out of this cycle and used to create something else, such as glucose. The other five molecules of G3P, so five-sixths of them, are going to go to help regenerate RUBP and continue the cycle. And of course, RUBP goes with Rubisco and binds to carbon dioxide and you go back to the cycle again and you only get one G3P for every time you go through this cycle and it's really important that you get that. So there are three main stages of the Calvin cycle. The first is called carbon fixation and this is for carbon is add to RUBP um, and the rate of this is due to the Rubisco enzyme. Then you have your carbon dioxide reduction, where I'm going to bring in the energy there for you in just a minute, and then you have RUBP regeneration, where five-sixths of the G3P produced in this reaction go back in to RUBP as opposed to producing anything else. Now, I told you we'd be bringing the energy in from the light reactions into the Calvin cycle, and we're going to do that right now. What you do is you come in with six ATPs. Those ATPs will put energy. This is going to be an exergonic reaction. It's going to give off some energy and become six ADPs and six phosphates. That will help produce the six BPGs. Now, the six BPGs, on the other hand, are not hit with ATP. They are hit with six NADPHs. Those little, they each have two electrons to give a piece. You will then have six NADP pluses that come out of that. The energy that releases takes the six BPGs into six G3Ps. I know it's a lot of letters, just bear with me. Once you have those five G3Ps left from the one that was removed to produce glucose or another sugar, three more ATPs come in, hit that, and convert it to RUBP, leaving you with three more ADPs and three phosphates. So these molecules that are supplying energy that I'm circling here in the lime green all came from the light reaction of photosynthesis. They all originated in those thylakoid membranes. They, or the, the process that created them occurred there in the thylakoid membranes. The Calvin cycle is occurring in the stroma. So if you'll notice, when I left you off with those NADPHs and the ATPs, they weren't inside the membrane. They were outside the membrane, membrane in the stroma, which is where the Calvin cycle occurs. So these three sources of energy originate in the light reactions, and then they fuel the Calvin cycle. Now, as I mentioned, you've got that one G3P, and that one G3P is where we're going to get our glucose and other products that the plants produce. But it takes two G3Ps to produce a single molecule of glucose.
So it takes two complete cycles of the Calvin cycle to get a single molecule of glucose. So when you see this, don't think, oh, it's producing 6G3P, so I can get three glucoses out of it. It's not going to happen. So let's take this. We've looked at the light cycle now. We have looked at the Calvin cycle. And let's write out the complete formula for photosynthesis. You have six carbon dioxides because it takes three carbon dioxides for a single rotation of the Calvin cycle and two cycles to get glucose. So six CO2 plus six H2O, the water, remember, was back there in the light reaction. The sunlight from the light reaction gives you C6H12O6, which is a single molecule of glucose, and oxygen, which came out of the light reaction was that waste product. Remember, it left through the stomata as the carbon dioxide is coming in. That pretty much wraps up the big points on the Calvin cycle I wanted to cover. I do have a review video for you that covers just a rehash of all this information.